excited about everything that God's doing and, and appreciate y'all coming and being a part of it and getting a taste of uh, Karis Bible College. It's just really, really awesome. I'm so thankful for everything God's doing. And my staff, I'd like to just say thanks to everybody. I mean, we've had people working nearly nonstop. Ron, Randy back there in the sound booth, I told him he needed to go home because he's, he's awesome. Thank you, Randy. We've rented a lot of cameras and stuff. Eventually, we will have all of our own equipment, but you know, the distance here, we had to rent cameras, and my guys have been up here testing for a week before this. They've been up here late at night. Randy is one that has just been working nonstop, and all of these people are just doing great. We've also got another group downstairs over here that's uh, controlling all of the live streaming that's going all around the world. And they're doing all of that. And so the live streaming is getting all, I think it's either five or six camera positions. And they're getting that and stuff. And they're actually uh, seeing a lot more than what you're seeing on this main screen up here. And we've just got a lot of people that have put in a lot of time. And I tell you, if it wasn't for all the people that God has sent to help us, uh, we simply could not be doing what we're doing. So I just want to publicly say thanks to all of them. Amen. And we try and get this across that you don't have to be behind the pulpit to be in full-time ministry. You know, we've got right at 300 employees and every one of them is a full-time ministry. It takes every one of them to do what we're doing and they are in the ministry. And I think sometimes people miss that and they get to thinking that unless they're standing up here that they aren't a minister. But I guarantee you, we couldn't be putting these signals out. We couldn't do, do the other things we're doing without them. So... What a blessing they are. I tell you, that's one of the greatest joys that Jamie and I have is to see all of the people. I may just uh, stick with this because I have to stick that through my shirt and by the time I do it and watch everybody watch me undress, I just would soon pass, I think. But um, Jamie and I are so thankful and one of the things that is such a blessing is to see all of the people that God has sent to us and I mean quality people, the best absolutely the best and uh, I never will forget the days when I used to uh, you know we would Jamie and I'd take everything to a meeting we would set it up we'd put out all of the stuff and I would stand back and uh, stand at the product tables and things like this and people would come in and of course I was on radio then nobody had ever seen me so they would come and they'd say, man, who is this guy? Have you ever, what about him? And I'd say, he's okay. You ought to listen to this one and this one. And I'd just let them talk. And they'd say, well, he sounds so boring. And they'd just say all of these things. And then uh, I'd get up, and, or Jamie would get up and start the singing. And I'd run the soundboard. And then when she got through, she'd come back and run the soundboard. And I'd get up and start preaching. And all of the people that had been saying these things about me, I had their attention. They were wondering what I was going to say. And I mean, it was like a juggling act. And it was, it was a one-man band. And now to see all of the people that God has brought is just absolutely amazing. It's awesome. So I'm enjoying not doing everything. It's great. Just wonderful, amen. Let's turn over to Matthew chapter 6. I know that this is a familiar passage of Scripture for many of you. But we're going to receive an offer and give you an opportunity uh, to give and to be a part of this. Uh, again, I'd like to say that if anybody here needs an offering envelope, we've got our ushers here. And if you hold your hand up, they'll get you an offering envelope. This is for cash giving or for our credit or debit card. And if you're making out a check, you can make it out to Andrew Womack Ministry. But if you need one of these envelopes, just hold your hand up and one of our ushers will, will help that. Uh, in Matthew chapter 6, this is a really familiar passage of Scripture, but in verse 33, it says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And you know, most of us have heard this, but really in practical terms, not many people live this way. Many people uh, put all kinds of things above the kingdom of God. I've had so many people tell me that, you know, if I had any money to give, I'd give it. 
And with some people, that may be an accurate statement, but with most people, what it means is I've already used up everything that God gave me on myself, and I don't have anything left. And that's not the way that the Lord told us to live. He told us to put God first, to seek first the kingdom of God. And this isn't talking about just in you know general categories. If you take the whole sixth chapter right here and read this in context, he's talking about money. He's talking about don't lay up uh, riches and treasures here on this earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt. And he goes through and talks about consider the lilies of the field. Look at the grass and all of these things and God takes care for them. Won't he take care for you? If you read the context, that's what he's talking about. Don't worry about what you eat, where you sleep, what you're clothed with, and then he says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things will be added unto you. The things that he's talking about are what you eat, where you sleep, and what you're clothed with. And here's a principle that, you know, God had to, I, th I believe you have to receive this by revelation. I've never been able to convince anybody of this. It just has to be the Holy Ghost that gives it to you, but it would sure help if you would open up your heart and ask him to show this to you. But if you would literally put God's kingdom first in every area of your life, but specifically in the area of finances, and if you would make the priority to follow God's instructions and do what he says, God would supernaturally take care of your needs. That's simple to say, but you know what? Most people don't understand that. Most people think, but I worked and I've got to pay my rent. I've got to do this and I've got to buy clothes and I've got to do these things. And God, if there was anything left over, I would give to you. What you're doing, you aren't putting first the kingdom of God. You're putting yourself first. You're putting your needs first. And somebody say, well, somebody's got to take care of me. If I didn't pay my dues and do all of these things, how would I survive? God is saying, if you put first the kingdom of God, God will take care of you. God will cause supernatural finances to flow towards you. God will meet your needs in a miraculous way. And I, this is what I'm saying, that this has to come by revelation because this doesn't make sense to the natural mind, but I have proven it and I'm telling you that when you put first the kingdom of God, God will take care of you and God will take care of you better than you would take care of yourself. God is El Shaddai, not El Chipo. God paves his streets with gold. He's building a mansion for every one of us. God is not cheap. And if you would really put God first, God would take care of you better than what you could take care of yourself. You know, Sue was giving a testimony about that and about how God has just miraculously provided for them. I actually had a man who one time in Chicago that for about 10 years or so, he bought Jamie and me cars and gave them to me. And they weren't cheap cars. They were nice cars and he paid for them. And I was actually embarrassed because there I was a preacher and I'd go, you know, to get hay at the feed store. And they said, this is a really nice van. How did you get this? They said, what do you do for a living? And I said, well, I'm a preacher. And people would look at me like preachers shouldn't be driving this nice of a vehicle. And I was kind of embarrassed by it. And I just mentioned something to him one time. I said, you don't have to give me as fancy of a car. I said, man, what a blessing you've been. And I said, I'll live in something less. And he looked at me and he says, unless you're embarrassed over what you've got, you hadn't tapped into God's supply. He says, God, and that's when he begins to say, God paves his streets with gold. God does this. And if you can look at everything and, and, and people look at you and think, well, man, they're cheap then you know what? God's not your source. I'm not saying you have to be wasteful and I'm not saying you have to live in a million dollar mansion or anything, but I'm saying God will meet your needs supernaturally. And I've really uh, uh, believed that. You know, this building that we built, we didn't, we didn't just try and waste money or anything. Downstairs, I've got a column right about under that front row right there that I didn't want. I told them I want that whole thing open. I don't want a column in the middle of the room. And they said, it'll cost you about a million and a half dollars. And I said, I could live with that. <laughs> you know what? I don't just waste money. 
and stuff like this. But I'm saying we did. We just did what we felt like God wanted us to do. And you know what? God supplies our needs. And I've told people that have come to me before, and you know they're ministers and they want they need help, but it's just a one man operation, and they need somebody to help them, but they're afraid I can't afford it. And I said, you know what? The right person will never cost you money. They make you money. They will help you. And I have to change people's attitude that if you just put first the kingdom of God, what is God telling you to do? Do what God tells you to do. And if you'll do that, the supply will always be there. But most people try and take care of themselves and then give God what's left over. The scripture says that you're supposed to give the first fruits to God. And I'm just sharing with you that if you would do that, God will supernaturally supply for you. He might use your job. He will use your job. He told us to work. He will do things, but it will be a supernatural supply. It will be on, beyond your ability. And I'm telling you, God will take care of you. Many of you are probably praying about school and what should we do. You know, if God has spoken to you, do what God tells you to do. Put first the kingdom of God. And if you do that, well, then God is going to give you a supernatural supply. Amen? So I just want to encourage you in the offering tonight to put God first. And there's many ways you can do this, but in the area of finances, it says we're supposed to give him the first fruits, not the leftovers, but the very first, the cream of the crop. And if you will just do that, God will start a supernatural flow of his prosperity and his blessing towards you. It's absolutely true. Amen. So, Father, we thank you and we just praise you for these promises. Thank you that Jesus told us that when we put first the kingdom of God, that you will add all of these other things to us. And, Father, we believe that. And tonight as we give, Father, we are doing what your word says. Test me, prove me, try me, see if it doesn't work. And, Father, we are putting it to the test. We're doing what your word says. And I believe that as we give, that it's given back unto us supernaturally, that people will prosper. People that right now maybe have a desire to come to school and wonder how they're going to do it, I'm asking that you'd help them to step out in faith and to give and to trust you and believe you. And we are going to see a supernatural return on this investment in the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. You can receive the offering. Hallelujah. I tell you, we've been having an awesome time. Have we got anybody here tonight that this is your first service that you've been to? You just came tonight? Can I see you? We still got new people. Praise God. Glad you're here. Awesome. I tell you, it's been wonderful. We've got a group of crutches and things, uh, canes in here by my office where uh, people left without them have been healed. Last night, I mentioned that during the healing service uh, yesterday afternoon that one of our uh, security guys here, uh, David, his mother was watching live streaming and she had a pretty large uh, growth on her breast and God just, it just was instantly gone. It dissolved. Well, we got a further report today and her husband was sitting there watching the show and he was deaf and he was healed. So all of that happened to the same family. That's pretty awesome, amen. And we've just been seeing some wonderful things happen. I tell you, Jesus is alive and well. And as I've been teaching, you know, it's the Lord is not the one who is holding out on us. He has provided everything. It's just we don't understand. We don't know what has been done. And this is the purpose of CBC uh, is to teach people what the Word of God says. I've been teaching specifically out of the book of Mark, and I'm in Mark chapter 4 this morning. I got down to, I believe it was verse 17. So I want to go back over there. All of us, every speaker has been talking about the importance of getting the Word of God in your life and what the Word of God will do for you. And this parable is about the man who sowed the seed. There was four different types of ground. The seed is representative of the word of God. The ground is representative of men's hearts. And as I said earlier today, I believe that they are not only four different categories of man's hearts, but it's also four progressive steps that you go through. The first one, and this is what I focused on primarily this morning, 
is in uh, Mark chapter 4 and in verse 15. It was people that didn't understand the word of God and Satan had free access to come steal the word of God from them. You've got to understand the word. It can't be just told you that God wants to do something, but how does he want to do it? How do you walk in the word of God? How do you have joy? How do you have peace? How do you prosper? How do you do these things? We've got to understand. That's the very first step. And if you don't have understanding, then the word never penetrates the ground and Satan has total access to steal it away. The second uh, type of ground is in verses 16 and 17. I read this this morning, but let's go back and read this because I'm not through with that. In verse 16, it says, And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word immediately receive it with gladness and have no root in themselves and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. You know, let me point out another thing I didn't mention this morning, but for those people who believe that God just sovereignly moves and he does whatever and everything that happens to you is somehow or another God's plan for your life. And that is a huge segment of the body of Christ. This verse right there just counters all of that because this says that afflictions and persecutions come for the word's sake to steal it out of your heart. Afflictions and persecutions, problems, sickness, disease, hurt and pain and all of these kind of things is not sent from God to make you better. It is sent from the devil. It is a uh, weapon to steal the word from you. I tell you, if you don't understand that, then you are going to wind up embracing your problems. And the Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 7, Submit yourselves therefore unto God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Satan doesn't flee until you resist. And the word resist means to actively fight against. This teaching that God is in control of the problems and this is somehow or another working something good and causing some redemptive purpose in your life makes you submit to those problems. You can't resist and submit at the same time. Notice James 4, 7, submit yourselves unto God and resist the devil. Those are opposite things. You can't be going this direction and that direction at the same time. If you are submitted unto the devil, then you are resisting God's plans for you. Man, that is powerful right there. And I could spend a lot more time on that, but I'm telling you, you've got to understand that afflictions and persecutions are not good things directed by God to make you better. They are things that Satan does fighting against you to steal the word of God from you. And it says that these people, when the afflictions and persecutions come, they don't have any root in themselves, and so they only endure for a while, and, and they don't bring any fruit to perfection. You've got to recognize that afflictions and persecutions are the devil, and you've got to stand against them. You know, uh, I can actually take persecution, Matter of fact, this is just a little sideline. I'll get back on topic, but, uh, you know, I was mentioning this morning about uh, the recent conference I went to and all of the good things that happened, but I was treated so well. I was honored, and I, all of these things happened, and I actually told the people who were with me, I said, you know what? I've gotten pretty used to people criticizing me, but I don't know how to handle all of this. It was hard. I, I'm having to adjust. I'm living in a time where people, people are favoring me and good things are happening, but you know what? I've gotten used to persecution. I actually, in a sense, take it as a compliment. I mean, if you throw a rock into a pack of dogs, the one that yelps the loudest got hit. And I know that this means that, man, the word must have penetrated. It must have struck a chord. And you can get to a place to where instead of looking at persecution and taking it like, God, what's wrong with me? This helped me immensely to understand that it's not personal. It's Satan trying to steal the word. It's Satan coming against the word. And I don't take it personally anymore. Man, this is big. I know some of you are maybe not relating to me right now and thinking it's not that big of a thing. Well, if you haven't been persecuted, it's like uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12 says, all those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If you hadn't been persecuted, it's because you aren't godly. Amen. That blessed you, didn't it? 
All who will live God. You know, in the Greek, that word all means all. It means everyone who is living a godly life is going to be persecuted. If you aren't persecuted, if you never bump into the devil, it's because you're both headed the same direction. You turn around and start following God, and there will be people that receive, and there will be good things that happen, but I guarantee you, you will be persecuted. Absolutely. That's just the way that it is. So you need to understand that this affliction and persecution comes against the word, trying to steal the word from you. And it says it happens because you don't have root in yourself. I started on this this morning and gave you a number of examples, but it just takes time for the word to get rooted on the inside and our impatience and our desire to see the full fruit and the full results and not to stay the course is one of the greatest hindrances against the word of God. I tell you, if you are going to really see the Word of God work in your life, you are going to have to learn patience. I don't even want to go there, but in real quickly, <laughs> James chapter 1, if any man, you know, uh, desires uh, patience, let's see, how does that say? Tribulation worketh patience. No, that's Romans chapter 5. What's Count it all joy when ye fall into divers temptations, knowing that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire wanting nothing. Those verses have been twisted to say that if you're praying for patience, you're praying for problems. That's not true. Problems do not give you patience. If they did, then the people who have been troubled the most would be the most patient. And that is not true. The scripture says in Romans 15, 4, that uh, the scriptures bring patience and comfort through scriptures. The word of God is what brings patience. Uh, patience into your life but you will have problems and if you stand against those problems and use what God gives you you will learn patience and, it, and you will be better but those problems didn't come to help you anyway I don't want to go over there and teach on all of this tonight but uh, anyway my point is that it just takes time to see the word of God and if you aren't willing to give it time and let the word take root on the inside of you then this, uh, these afflictions and persecutions, you won't be able to overcome them. You've got to be rooted to overcome the afflictions and persecutions that come against you. That is a big, big statement right there. And it only comes through the Word of God. It doesn't come through prayer. It doesn't come through passion, desire. It comes through the Word of God. They don't have the seed rooted on the inside of them. Amen? You know, we use all kinds of excuses today and people say things like, you know, we just don't understand the pressures that the young people are under today and uh, we'll talk about the pressures of modern life and all of these things and basically what I believe it is, it's an attempt by people to try and explain away or give an excuse why they aren't more productive in the Word of God. And they just talk about you just don't know how hard it is today. And yet the scripture teaches there's nothing new under the sun. It says in 1 John chapter 2 that there's, you know, all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of God, but it's of the world. It only listed three things. Jesus had three temptations. And the scripture says he was tempted in all points, like as we are, yet without sin. I believe that's Hebrews 4.15. If Jesus was tempted in all points, did he, did he deal with the pressures of modern life? Absolutely. It's the same thing. It's just in a different package, a different wrapper, a different bow. And anyway, this is a cop-out when we think that nobody knows the problem that I've felt. Nobody knows my problems. And we talk about all of this. The truth is that it's the exact same thing. We aren't dealing with anything that anybody else had. Jesus felt your temptations. It was the same thing. If you peel the temptation back to its root, it always comes back to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And so anyway, my point in saying this is that to get rooted in the word of God, you have to give time to this and let this word produce in you this ability to withstand these afflictions and persecutions. It's not worse than it's ever been. It's the same thing it's ever been. There's no temptation taking you but such as is common to man. And if you think that you're an exception and that your situation is worse than anybody else, well, then you've already voided this. So you, haven't under, you aren't standing in the word. I'm telling you, it's the same. 
This friend of mine over in England, when he was a little kid, was when the bomb was when England was being bombed during World War II. And you know, they took him when I forget exactly how old he was, five, seven, or something like that. And for two years he lived in a field with a hundred something other kids in tents, separated from his parents. And they did this by the thousands all through England to get them out of the major cities where they were being bombed and stuff. You know what, to me, that's pressure. But today, kids talk about, you know, that they're trying to keep up with everybody else and they don't have a smartphone. They got a dumb phone. <laughs> and their shoes don't light up when they walk and it's just so much pressure. Man, that's not pressure. The only thing that makes our world today such a pressure situation is the fact that there's such a vacuum on the inside. That's a big statement right there. You know, when I was in the sixth grade, I got in trouble for talking, and so my teacher put me right on the front row, right in front of his desk, and I had to sit right there. And uh, anyway, he did this experiment where he took a one-gallon gas can and heated it on a Brunson burner and got the thing red hot, and then he screwed the lid on, and what he was trying to do was to teach us that hot air occupies a larger volume than small, uh, cold air. And so as the thing cooled off, the air inside compressed and it formed a partial vacuum. And he, after he did that and screwed that lid on, he just set it right there on this desk in front of me. I was looking right at it. And over a period of time, as that thing cooled and this vacuum formed inside, that thing began to crack and pop and it actually bent in two and fell off of the desk right in front of my feet. And I never will forget that. And nobody touched it. Nothing happened. It, you know, all it was was the natural, normal atmospheric pressure crushed that can because it had a vacuum on the inside. If it would have had an equal pressure on the inside, this normal atmospheric pressure wouldn't have done a thing to it. And you know, that's an example of what I'm talking about. It's not that things are worse today than they've ever been. It's that there is a vacuum on the inside and a lot of it, I'd say that nearly all of it is traced to a lack of the truths of God's word. Did you know a generation ago in our society, lost people knew more about the word of God than a lot of Christians do. I was talking to one of our students that told me just the other day that when she came to school uh, two years ago, she was very liberal and she just hated me talking about conservative type of things and, you know, pro-life instead of abortion and getting off of welfare and not being a taker but a person who's a contributor and a giver and I just say things about this and she said she'd just nearly have to plug her ears and just pass over those things and wait until I got back on topic talking about the word of God. And she says, but you know what? I've changed. She says, everything has changed. And so I said, I would really like to just talk to you and find out what changed you because I don't understand how people can claim to be Christians and love God with all of their heart and be for abortion and for homosexuality and four things that God is against. I said, I just do not understand how this happens. And I sat down and talked with her and she says, I loved God, but I didn't love the word before I came here. And you know what she was saying? This vacuum on the inside of her was caused because the word of God wasn't dominating her life. And there are just so many people. You can love God and still have values that are contrary to the word, but you can't love the word of God and let this word take root on the inside of you without it changing your life. I absolutely believe that. There may be some people right here that don't like that very much, but I believe it's true. And she was telling me, she says, I thought I knew the word, but I didn't know the word until she sat and heard some of these things. And you know what? I really believe that, that many Christians today, they just don't know what the word teaches. And because of this, this is the reason that afflictions and persecution and other things come against the word and they lose it because they do not have a revelation of the word of God. The word of God, if you let it get rooted on the inside of you, it'll give you strength, stability. It'll give you a direction for your life. It'll give you a, a system of right and wrong instead of everything being relative. Amen? 
Some of you aren't as excited about that as I am, but I, I believe it's absolutely true. Praise God. The word of God will change your values, but sadly, many people don't let the word get in the way of what they believe. You know, when I was going through, I told you this morning some of those things when I was still in the Baptist church and what I was sharing wasn't Baptist and so I got a lot of criticism and I was just being attacked and stuff. This man, Joe Nay, who is like a mentor to me and he really helped me get going. He was uh, further down the road than I was and he would hold meetings and I would go to his meetings and uh, he would just you know, minister the word and see great things happen. And right in the midst of this whole thing where people were criticizing me and I was feeling really discouraged by this, I went to one of his meetings and he called me out of the group and he gave me a word that just transformed my life and it fits perfectly with this. And he says, I see you in a vision and you're like a runner on one of these oval tracks, a quarter mile track. And he says, you're running the race and you're leading the race. You're winning the race. But the people in the grandstands are yelling at you and saying you're doing it all wrong and they're criticizing you. And he says, I see you getting off of the track and going up into the grandstands and arguing with the spectators. And he says, even if you win the argument, you're going to lose the race. He says, stay on track, stay on track. And you know, that was just such a revelation. This is what... Uh, persecution, affliction is all about, it's to get you off your focus of Jesus and go to defending yourself and trying to justify yourself. And, and that is not what God called us to do. You've got to stay on track and recognize that any time afflictions, persecutions come against you, it's Satan trying to steal the word and you cannot react to it. We had a thing right now, I don't even know how many blogs there are written against me, but there's hundreds if not thousands written against me that I'm, one of them says I'm the most dangerous man in America and all kinds of weird stuff. And my staff brought me about four of these and showed me these blogs and he says, do you see what people are writing about you? And I read four of them or something and I actually thought it was pretty good. They all said I was of the devil, but they would start off by saying, he's not exactly like everybody else. He gives his stuff away. He's not in it for the money. And they would compliment me and then say, but he believes in the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in the tongues, so he's of the devil. And, but I thought, well, at least they complimented me first. So <laughs> I didn't think it was so bad. But anyway, I told my staff, I don't want to do anything with this. And I didn't explain to them, but it was that principle I was talking about. I, I know why affliction persecution comes. It's to get me off the track and get me to doing something else and start spending my energy and time worrying about what people think about me. You know, it says in John chapter 5, verse 44, Jesus was speaking and he says, How can you believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that comes from God alone? This is Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith speaking. And he says, if you are seeking honor that comes from people, then you can't believe. Man, that is one huge statement right there. And I'm telling you, nearly every person just naturally has a desire for self-preservation. When somebody does something to you, you get offended and you want to fight back. You want to justify yourself. You want to defend yourself. You're always worried about looking good. You think that if you don't do something, well, who's going to take care of me? God, amen. He says, I'm the avenger. Let me take vengeance on things. And it's counterintuitive. It's not natural. You have to go out of your way to keep from feeling like you've got to defend yourself and justify yourself. But it's Satan trying to get you off the track. So anyway, I told my staff, I said, I just don't want to do anything about this. Well, about three months later, they came back and this time they had 50 or something of these blogs and they said it's getting worse and man, there's people search engines. Anytime they put in your name, it brings this up and we've come up with a way to fix this and we can, I don't know what they, I didn't really listen long enough to hear the whole thing, but I told, and they were saying we can fix this and it will stop these people and it'll stop driving people to their website. And I got a little bit upset and I said, look, I told you I don't want to do this. And I said, never again do I want one dollar of my income diverted to trying to defend myself and counter what somebody else says. I said, I'm, that's getting me off the track. 
And even if I win the argument, I'm going to lose the race. Satan would win because I wouldn't be using my television time to preach the word of God and to help people talk about what the word can do and what God can do. I'd be over there defending myself. And I'm telling you, this just happens so often. And it happens in your own life. This is a major distraction. And there are many people that the word of God has been stolen from them because somebody's criticized them. You will face persecution. And if it gets to bothering you and you spend your time meditating and thinking, well, this is what I would say to them. And this is what I should have said to them. And if you're doing that, that's time that you aren't spending in the word of God. And it's just stealing the word of God from you. I had another good friend of mine and we were hiking up Pikes Peak one time and we have a mutual friend, the same guy that used to buy me the cars that I was talking about. But I did something that he didn't like. And so he still was friends with me, but he would just criticize me and say a lot of bad stuff about me. And this other guy was a mutual friend also and he criticized him and he criticized both of us because we were here. So anyway, we were hiking up Pikes Peak and he says, did you hear what so-and-so said about you lately? And I said, no. And he started into it and I said, look, I just don't want to hear it. I said, I don't want anybody renting space in my mind. I do not want to hear what this guy's got to say about me because I knew it was critical. And so he got quiet for a few minutes and then he started up again and he said, but he said this, you didn't hear this. And he started telling me again. And I said, look, I don't want to hear it. We could talk about something else than what this guy thinks of me. So he got quiet for about 10 minutes and finally he just says, why doesn't it bother you what he says about you? And I said, because I don't value his opinion the way you do. Did you know the only people that will ever bother you are if you place a value on them. You're the one that gave them. You're the one that made your life dependent upon their acceptance. You need to let this soak in a minute. But I can guarantee you, if you're offended, if you're hurt because somebody has done something, you're the one that placed that value on their life. You could come to me and say the exact same words to me that your husband or your wife or whoever it is that's offended you said to you. You could come and say the exact same words to me and I guarantee you I wouldn't take the same offense that you do. You know why? Because I don't value your mate the way that you do. And somebody said, but you're supposed to value your mate. Well, you're supposed to love them. You're supposed to honor them, but you are not supposed to be codependent upon your mate to the point that if something goes wrong, that Jesus isn't enough. You have to have your mate's approval. That's a good word. And I, there's some people think, well, that's wrong. And you have totally embraced. And it's because you have made it so that you have to have this person's approval. You have to have your parents' approval or your children's approval or your whoever's approval. You're the one that placed the value on that and made their opinion so important. You place value on every single person and every single thing that you encounter. And what you need to do is just redo this like we were using during the offering tonight and seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and let everything else in comparison to be of no worth. And you get to where God, you're the only one that I have to have. Your approval is all I seek. If you love me, then it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. And if you aren't living there, then like Jesus said, how can you believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that comes from God alone. If you are a man pleaser, the fear of man brings a snare. And I'm saying some things that are radical to most people's experience, but you know where you get this from is the word. Then you just see example after example of people that put God first and God prospered them and they were persecuted and stuff and yet they came through. And after a while you get to seeing that, you know, all you really need is God. All you have to have is his approval. Jesus, you know, fed the 5,000. And there was, that was 5,000 men. There was probably women and children there, 10 or 15,000 people. And the people were so excited that the next day they ran all the way around the Sea of Galilee to get over to the other side. And when they found him, they wanted to make him king. They wanted to take him in by force, make him king. And Jesus saw through it. Did you know most of us would be sucked right into this? 
and think, man, these people want to make me king. I can guarantee you, Jesus knew that these same people were going to be yelling, crucify him, crucify him, and he did not place that value on them. Even when they were saying good things, he kept his focus on what his father said. And he knew, he, he told him, he says, you aren't seeking me because you love me. You seek me because I filled your belly. I multiplied the food. And he says, you need to seek the manna that comes down from God alone. And they thought, well, boy, here's another miracle. Maybe he's going to produce manna. And so they said, evermore, give us this bread. And he said, I am the bread of life. And they said, who are you saying that you are? And they begin to criticize him. And he says, I tell you, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you won't see the kingdom of God. And immediately they thought he was thinking of cannibalism. And did you know most people today who are, again, men pleasers and too sensitive to what people have to say because the word isn't rooted in them and afflictions and persecutions, criticism of people steals the word from them. Most ministers today, I guarantee you, would have fallen all over themselves trying to explain this. Oh, I'm not talking about cannibalism. They would have tried to make it clear. I tell you, we're just so worried about offending people and being politically correct and pastors won't say the truth. I've had a number of pastors come to me and say, I, would, I believe the things that you said, but man, I got so criticized, I just wouldn't say them. You know what that is? That keeps you from believing. Jesus, instead of responding and saying, God, you guys have misunderstood me. I'm not talking about cannibalism and trying to explain it away. He turned around and he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. He made it worse. And the whole 5,000 people left him. All of them. Can you imagine that? You know, I don't know how many people we have in here, but it's certainly not 5,000. What if there was 5,000 people present here tonight and because of me preaching, everybody just got up and walked out? Did you know most people would be totally devastated because they depend upon the acceptance of people too much? I'm not saying that you should encourage problems and go out and try and offend people. That's not love. That's not what I'm talking about. But I'm saying you ought to be free to just say what you believe that the Lord is leading you to say and not be fearful of people's opinion. If this was to happen tonight, I guarantee you most people would just, they'd do nearly anything to please come back. And if my staff stuck here with me, I guarantee I'd be down there. Do you guys still love me? Are you going to stick with me? Please stick with me. Somebody's got to stay with me. But you know what Jesus did? After all 5,000 left, he turned to his staff and he says, you want to leave too? There's the door. And Peter, he thought about it. He says, where else would we go? <laughs> if he'd have had an option, he might have taken it. But they had burnt their bridges behind them. And he says, Lord, we can't go anywhere else. You're the ones with the words of eternal life. But Jesus was so secure that see, affliction and persecution didn't steal the word from him because he was out to please his father only. And if saying what his father told him to say caused 5,000 people to leave, so be it. Man, that's huge. And this is the way that God wants us to be. And you aren't gonna get there just naturally. God created us for fellowship. God created man for relationship. And I believe he built into us something that longs to get along with people and to be loved and accepted by other people. It is a natural tendency. But because of the fallen world that we live in and because Satan fights through people and stuff, I can guarantee you, you will have persecution and you are going to have to overcome this natural tendency to be liked and loved by everybody. If God is going to use you, you are going to have some problems. I had one of my students, I don't know if he's here tonight, Travis, but I was talking to him this afternoon and I gave him, a, oh, Travis is back there at the back. And uh, I prayed with him. He wanted me to just pray over him before he graduated from school. And the Lord showed me a number of things, but one of them was that the Lord showed me he was going to be a powerful leader and that he was going to be involved in politics. And afterwards, he confirmed that the Lord had already shown him these things. And one of the things that I spoke to him, I said, man, you are going to be persecuted. You are going to be criticized. You are going to have a lot of things come against you. 
And you know what? There's a lot of people that would make great leaders, but they can't stand the persecution. And it's because you don't have root in yourself. That's what these verses are saying. God has used these verses really strongly in my life that any time I go to, you know, whining about what people think about me, I go back and realize, God, I'm not, the word's not rooted in me the way that it should. I've got my attention off. I'm off of the track and I'm up in the grandstands worrying about what people think about me. Jesus is enough. This guy, Walter, was his name, and I forget exactly uh, the whole situation, but he came to our minister's conference, and I think he was Norwegian or Sweden or something, Swedish, and he went to Africa and started uh, churches. He was a missionary in Africa, and he had some miraculous things. I mean miracles, like Bible miracles, uh, happening in his life, but he got discouraged because he didn't have finances. He was in Africa and his support base was back in Sweden or wherever, and he was out in the jungle praying. And he was just crying out, oh God, I don't have this, and oh God, I don't have this, and I'm so far away from, from all of my supporters, and he was just complaining about how bad everything was and talking about it, and he said that there was this voice audible voice that came and it shook the ground. It was like an earthquake. And this booming voice said, Walter, and called his name three times. And man, he just fell on his face and he says, yes, Lord. And he said, aren't I enough? And he repeated it. Aren't I enough? And he just kept saying it. And you know what? It redirected Walter's attention. And he wound up starting, I forget the exact number, but at the time I talked to him, this is 25, 30 years ago, he had had over 2,000 churches in Africa that this man had planted. And he went out and saw all of these things happen because he quit being dependent upon people and their approval and he just started putting his attention on God. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, there's a lesson for us to learn here that affliction and persecution is designed to steal the word from you. And if you get to worrying about what people say and about the problems that come against you, and if that makes you get out of the word of God, Satan is one. If you get to defending yourself and arguing, even if you win the arguments, you'll lose the race. You just need to stay on track. Amen? Boy, that is a great word. And let me just make one other application before I move on. But there's some of you that maybe God has spoken to about coming to school. But you know what? You're worried about how am I going to break this to my church, to my friends, or, you know, just all kinds of relationships. We've had people before that, you know, their kids think they're crazy for leaving a job and a house and you're already established and you're coming to school and, and kids just absolutely think you're crazy. And you know what? There are some that have come and those who have done things like that would tell you it's well worth it. But there are some that didn't come because you know what? They had, the, uh, they had to have the approval of men and they just couldn't do this. You know what that is? That's an affliction and persecution. People don't understand. When I first, when the Lord first spoke some things to me, I had a lot of people that didn't understand and criticize me and I finally came to realize I need to cut them some slack because they didn't have God tell them. God told me. It's easy for me to believe God, but they have to trust that I'm hearing from God. And that's a lot harder on other people. But you know what? You need to recognize your kids, your parents, your whoever it is, they didn't hear what you heard. God hadn't spoken to them what he's spoken to you. And so understand that not everybody's going to agree. But you just need to get to where you do what God tells you to do if it hair lips every devil in hell. You are just going to do it. You have to put that kind of a priority on the word of God. Again, I've had people come to me and say, God has told me to come to Bible college, but, and then they go off on some reason. I had this one guy from Chicago come and he, he says, God spoke to me. I know I'm supposed to be at Bible college, but he was a single guy living at home. He was being groomed to take over the family business. He was making lots of money. He was engaged to a girl and uh, his parents thought I was a cult, so they took him to his pastor 
and asked his pastor about me and his pastor said, absolutely, this is a cult. Don't go there. So the pastor was against him. His parents were against him. He was going to lose a lot of money, lose the family business, and his fiance said, if you go to that school, I'm not going with you. The wedding's off. And so this guy came and sat in my office and he says, I know God told me to do this, but, and he went through about a 20 minute explanation trying to show me all of these problems. And he just got through and he says, what do you think? And I said, you lost me the moment you said God told you to go to Karis Bible College. And he says, what do you mean? I said, if God told you to come to Karis Bible College, just do it. But what about this? And I said, I don't know about this. I'm saying, just do it. If God Almighty, who has, you know, he's got an entire universe to run and seven billion people to speak to and try and touch them and he's busy and he's got all of these things. And if God Almighty talks to you and tells you something, then you're gonna debate whether or not you do it. I said, what's wrong with you? I said, just do it. I, that's the way I think, but there's people that they know God is leading them to do something, but they, afflictions and persecutions, circumstances, situations, you know, maybe I shouldn't do this. I've had people come to me before and say, God told me to come here, but you know, I'm only 10 years away from retirement, and if I continue to work, I could get twice as much in retirement or whatever. And I've told him, I said, well, I understand. I'm, you know, God doesn't understand that you're close to retirement. God didn't know this. He probably made a mistake. You just do whatever you want to do. And, you know, God, he, he doesn't know as much as you do. And he told, you know, he should have waited to tell you 10 years later. And I'll just tell him stuff like that. I'm telling you, if God tells you to come, if it ruins your retirement, do it. Now, there's some wisdom, you know, if he tells you to come and you're only two days away from retirement, you know, it's going to take that long to pack. I'm not saying you just, I'm not saying you just go out and do something stupid, but if God tells you to do something, just do it. The word of God has to have dominance and, pr and priority in your life, and with most people, it doesn't. And what people think and circumstances and all kinds of things enter in and affect people. You, the word's not rooted in you if that's it. The word has to be the absolute final authority. And if it violates what people think about you, well, then you may not like it, but so be it. If it causes you to uproot and move from the place that you thought you'd live forever, who cares? So do it. So be it. If God tells you to do something, just do it. Whatever he says unto you, do it. That's what Mary told the servants. You have to get to where the word of God is what anchors you and it holds you and it dominates you and not your own reasoning. And I promise you, God is smarter than you are. And whatever God's telling you to do, it'll be the best thing. The Lord spoke to me about giving all of my materials away. And I could spend a lot long time talking about that, but you know, it didn't make sense. But I did it. And you know, it has proven to be one of the greatest things that I've ever done. I didn't know what I was doing, but there's people that have listened to me and received my ministry because of that one thing, because we give our materials away. There was one guy in Kansas City who his wife, he hated television and radio preachers at the time I was only on the radio. And he hated radio preachers and he refused to let his wife listen to any of this Christian stuff because all they're after is money. Well, she was sneaking around on the side and she heard my program and found out that I gave everything away. And so she went to her husband and she says, you can't say that he's after your money. He's giving this stuff away. And his argument, you know, he had no excuse. And so he says, well, I'm gonna listen to see if he's really, you know, if this is a trick or something. And he started listening to my program and he got born again, baptized in the Holy Ghost and became a partner of mine. You know what, I couldn't have figured that out, but God knew it, and God has supplied my need, and uh, I won't mention the name of this, but one of the largest ministries in America, I was out to eat with the, with the, two, with the uh, couple that ran this ministry, and uh, you know, it, we didn't really know each other that well, so it was a little bit cool, and finally the guy says, you're the guy that gives everything away, right? 
And I said, yeah. And he started saying, you know, that's not wisdom. Boy, we get this and we do, and we have all of this money come in. And if you would sell your stuff and if you'd do this, you could have so much more money. And anyway, we just began to tell him about how God had blessed us and we told him that we average around $80 per person that contacts us and 53% of all of the people that contact us don't give a thing. And yet, we average $80 per person. That stopped their argument. They never said another word about it. And I was just wondering, what do you average? But did you know from that time on, that ministry, they don't do it all the time, but they give away a lot of stuff now and they'll advertise it. If you don't have the money, do this. And man, it's because it works. Scripture says, give and it shall be given unto you. I'm not smart enough to figure that out, but when God just spoke to me, I do what God tells me to do and it may be contrary to your logic, but it works. We gotta get to where we aren't having to be like everybody else and have everybody else's acceptance and be pleasing to everybody else, what does God say to you? Let the word of God take root on the inside of you and if you'll do that, then you'll pass this second test that you have to go through to get the word of God working in your life. Man, that is powerful. And that doesn't come easily. It's going to take some time in the Word of God and you're going to have to have God speak some things to you and get more confident in God's ability than you are other people and quit depending on them. Let me just cover one other thing here real quickly before we quit tonight. But in the next verse, down here in verse 8, it says, And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the Word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things entering in choke the Word, and it becometh unfruitful. So here's the third type of ground. The first one, it never even penetrated the soil. Satan came and took it away immediately. The second type, it got down below the soil. They received it with gladness. There was some response, but they didn't have any fruit because they were uh, afflictions and persecutions got them off track. They got to licking their wounds and thinking about themselves instead of standing in the word of God and they didn't bring forth fruit. The third type actually began to start producing some fruit. Matter of fact, if you read this same thing in Luke, I won't take time to turn over there. In Luke, it says they didn't bring fruit to perfection. That means that there was fruit, but it was immature and it never grew and completed. So this third type of person is a person that started to get in the word. They had stood against afflictions and persecutions. They were so focused on the Lord that it didn't matter what other people thought or anything else. And the word of God was beginning to bring forth fruit. But the cares of the, this life and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things choked the word. You know, the word picture is that if you put a seed in the ground, you've got to weed it and take out all of these other things that would sap the nourishment and the water from that soil. Soil only has so much nutrients and moisture to give something, and if you let weeds grow up, those weeds will take away from this, and it will uh, hinder the plant from growing and producing fruit. So in the spiritual realm, the Word of God would work if you pass those first two tests and go through this, but the thing that happens then is people get diverted by the cares of this life. It doesn't have to be sin. You know, this could be raising a family. There's nothing wrong with raising a family, but you can get to where raising a family will choke the Word of God in your life. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with paying attention to your kids and raising a family, but we, again, our American lifestyle uh, I know some people that their kids are in five or six extracurricular activities. They do all of these things and they have all of these things going and stuff. And I mean the family never eats together. They spend no time together. And it's just most people think that activity is success. And it's not. The scripture says, be still and know that I am God in Psalms 46.10. And you can become so busy with good things. It doesn't have to be sinful things but you've got to learn how to discipline yourself and control it. You know, I'm in the ministry and everything I do has to do with the ministry and preaching to people and sharing with people and helping people. All of that's good, but I could totally destroy my own relationship with God by the ministry. Some of you may not understand that, but it's absolutely true. A minister is on call 24 hours a day. 
You wouldn't go take a job. I don't care how much they wanted to pay you. If you were on call 24 hours a day and you never got a vacation and you were always there and they could just call you at any time and yet that's the way most ministers are. If somebody dies, they'll call you in the middle of the night. You have to get up. I had a friend in Colorado Springs that hadn't been on a vacation in three years and I talked to him and he was convinced that he wasn't paying attention to his family and wasn't doing the things that he should do and so they planned a seven day vacation and he was locking the door to the house. The kids and the wife were in the car. They were gonna be gone for seven days and the phone rang and his wife said, don't answer it. And he says, but I'm the pastor. I've got to answer it. And she says, don't, she begged him. And he says, no, I've got to. And it turned out that his head usher or somebody had died and the family needed him and they canceled their vacation. Have you done this the way Janice is responding? You, was this you that I'm talking about? <laughs> I'm telling you, nobody would do that for a secular job, but in the ministry, people can make demands on you so that you don't have any time for the Lord. One time I was in Phoenix, Arizona and I'd just come from a meeting in Kansas City and I was preaching three times a day in Phoenix, Arizona for seven days in a row and I was in the afternoon service and I was preaching through the book of Romans and I, I mean literally, I was so burned out. I had been giving out without taking anything in that I was standing there and talking. And while I was talking, I was thinking, if I wasn't the one preaching, I'd leave this meeting. <laughs> I was, I just was tired, tired, tired. And I wanted to go home, sleep or something. And you know what? It wasn't sin that was stealing the word from me. I was so occupied with good things, ministering to people that it'll choke the word out of your life. Jesus would take his disciples and separate them and say, come apart into a desert place and rest a while. Jesus rested. Jesus separated himself. I'll say something here that really will not bless many of you because this is one of the big things today about man, I can multitask. All that means is that you do multiple things poorly. <laughs> Paul said this one thing I do and that's the reason Paul changed the world. And here we are 2,000 years later quoting from Paul and talking about Paul's because he didn't do everything and he didn't multitask. If you're a master of all trades or what is it, a jack of all trades, you're master of none. I'm telling you, if you're gonna succeed, you need to find out what it is God told you to do and you need to stick with it and focus on it and if, you, if Satan can't keep you from going the ways of God, then what he'll do is try and get you so busy and occupied that you no longer have time for your personal relationship in the word of God and you'll dry up on the vine. This is some great wisdom I'm giving you. And I'm telling you, most of us are just way, way, way too busy. You know, a few years back, I had a dream and I woke up I, in the dream I saw this huge banner that said Psalms 8610. And I've quoted that verse a thousand times, but for the life of me, I could not think of what Psalms 8610 said. So I got up and I went in and looked it up in the Bible. You know, it says, be still. Or is, is that right? 4610. Well, see, I wasn't seeing the banner. I was doing it by memory. <laughs> Psalms 46.10, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. And when I saw that, I've seen that scripture a hundred times. And anyway, I, it was in the summer. Jamie went into town to do something. And I thought, God's speaking this to me supernaturally. What does it mean to be still? And I wasn't totally sure. I don't believe that it means physically that you can't move. It's probably talking more about just focusing on God and getting rid of all of the distractions. But just to make sure, I thought I'm gonna sit still. And I got outside and I sat in this chair and I didn't move. All I did was blink and breathe for an hour and a half. I never moved. And I was shocked at what I learned because I heard the wind blowing through the trees and you know, it does it all of the time, but I get so busy that I didn't even notice the wind blowing through the trees. 
I was looking down and there must have been 5,000 ants all around me. And there were chipmunks. They were, because I was so still, they crawled up my leg and they were sitting on my, uh, on my leg. And I had a deer. You know, deer have real poor eyesight. And if you don't move and if you're upwind or downwind from them, uh, they really can't see. And I had a deer walk up and nearly touch my nose. I just sat there and this deer walked right up and was looking at me like this. And I was just amazed of all of these things that go on around me all of the time, but I'm so busy, I don't notice them. And you know what? I really believe that in the spiritual realm, this same thing's true. God is with us. God is trying to speak to us. The scripture says in Psalms chapter 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows his handiwork day unto day, utter his speech, night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no tongue, no language where this voice hasn't gone forth. God is speaking to us through creation. He's speaking to us through things. And we get so busy that you don't even recognize the sunrise. You don't even notice the moon coming up. You don't think about how nice it is and what God is doing. And we just get so busy that we can't hear. And I'm telling you, you have to have some downtime. If you're one of these that just loves to be occupied, the Word of God will be choked in your life. You have to have some time where you just spend in the presence of God. And you just let, you're just there and you're letting the word take root on the inside of you. And when you do that, you're weeding your garden. You're taking out all of the distractions. You're keeping these things from sapping the nourishment, your attention that should be going to the word of God and instead you're putting it on the word. And it'll make your fruit increase. You'll produce better fruit, bigger fruit, better fruit if you spend time with God. You know, I was in Washington, D.C. when Ronald Reagan died and they had the parade and uh, they put him in state and Jamie and I were there and we walked the, the, you know, I forgot what they call that, but that mile or two miles in between the Capitol and the um, Lincoln Memorial and we walked and all this. And I remember as I was walking on this gravel, I thought, this is really strange. I know that this makes noise, but I can't hear a thing. I couldn't hear a single step that I was making. And I remember observing that and wondering, I wonder what's happening. Why can't I hear this? And right after we did that, we went to the Shenandoah National Park and I started walking on the Appalachian Trail. And out there, there wasn't any of the city noise. There was so much traffic. There was planes. There was tour groups and there was all of these kind of things and there was just so much noise surrounding me that I couldn't hear a single step. But when I was on that Appalachian Trail and there wasn't anybody within miles of me, every step I took was just like thunder. It was so loud. And you know what? It was the same way in Washington, D.C., but all of the other things just choked it. It kept me from hearing that. And likewise, we get so busy in our life with all of the stuff that we do that it chokes the Word of God. If you would be still, if you would start weeding out these things, paring back things, not everything that is good is God. If you would start doing that and make the main thing the main thing, this one thing I do, I guarantee you it would, it would make a huge difference in the way that the Word of God produces in your life. And once again, let me just put in a pitch for CBC. This is one of the things that happens when you come here. You pluck yourself up from a, your natural situation, from all of these things, and you just come and you focus your attention on the Word of God and learning what God has to say. And I mean, it's life transforming. It'll change you. Amen? And anyway, I'm out of time tonight. So the last type of ground, let me just point out the last type of ground, it wasn't the type of ground that had more of anything. It had less, less rocks, less hard packed ground, less thorns, cares of this life. It had less. And one of the greatest things that I learned through this parable was that to be mightily used of God and to have fruit in your life, it doesn't take more, it takes less, less distractions. You know, I wasn't sure I could be more, but I was absolutely convinced I could be less. Man, if being less is what it's all about, just being focused on God and not distracted and not letting people criticize you and not having to have their approval 
and all of these things. If that's what it takes, I can do that. I might not be the, you know, the silver vessel, but I can be a surrendered vessel. I could commit myself to God. And this really encouraged me that God, I don't feel like I'm the sharpest knife in the drawer, but man, I can be focused on you. I can give up other things. I can make you first in my life. And that's what I've been seeking to do. And man, God has just blessed my socks off. God has blessed me, blessed me, blessed me. And these things that are in this parable are just some of the foundation truths about the word of God and how it works in the kingdom of God and in your life. And I'm telling you, it's up to you. God has given us the seed, the miraculous seed that is stronger than anything else. And he's given you a heart that just will instantly start bringing forth whatever is planted in it. And the only thing left is just for you to decide, for you to choose. If you choose to put God first, seek first the kingdom of God, then everything else will be added to you. God will do miraculous things in your life. But it's all up to you. It's not God that you need to plead with and get him to do something. God's done it. He gave it to you in seed form. I got something else great to share about this tomorrow morning, but anyway, we'll wait till tomorrow morning. I never finish. I just quit. And we'll keep going tomorrow morning. Amen. And I believe it'll be a blessing to you. So Father, we thank you for this word. Thank you for these truths that you taught. And I'm asking through the power of the Holy Spirit here tonight that the Holy Spirit would give us understanding and make personal application of these truths to our life where we are letting other people intimidate us. We have to have their approval. We've made ourselves codependent upon other people and other things. Father, help us to get back to just you, seeking first the kingdom of God and your righteousness and everything else will be added unto us. And so, Father, I'm asking that the Holy Spirit just confirm that in us. For those that are so busy with good things, but not God things, that they don't have any time for the Word of God to take root in their heart, I'm asking that you'd speak to them, Father, and help us to make these decisions and to make priorities and set you as the absolute first and final authority in our life. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we just agree and we receive that. Hallelujah. You know, I believe that there's a lot of people here that could benefit from this in many ways, but the Lord is speaking to me right now that there's some people here that this was specifically for you and that you have let the opinions of people stop you from doing what God told you to do. You have more, um, more vision than what you've acted on and you're not acting on it because of circumstances, because of people and things like that. And I just hear, hear the Lord saying tonight that you need to make a decision. You need to make a decision and you say, you know what, if God has spoken something to me, I will do it. I may have to seek wisdom about how to do it, the timing, God, you're gonna have to help me, but I'm putting this thing to rest. No longer is it a question of will, I'll do it. God, I will do what you tell me to do. And there are some of you here that you know what God has told you to do and you aren't doing it. For whatever the reason is, you need to change that tonight. And I'd just like to ask you right now, I know you're in front of people and most people want you to bow your head and close your eyes, but you know what, if you have to be that coerced and timid that you won't stand up in front of people who love you in a Christian meeting and admit that you need something. You'll never make it out there when you face this person who's been intimidating you. So I want to ask while everybody's eyes are open and your head is up, if you would just stand up, if that's you, and say, I need to act on what God has told me and quit worrying about everybody else and these things stealing the Word of God from me. If that's you, I want you just to stand up right now and make this decision that you're gonna do what God has spoken to you. There may be some wisdom or something that you have to gain, but you will do it. No longer is it a question of will I do it? I will do what God told me to do. You know, this is a lot of people. And if you've understood and responded really correctly to what I'm saying, no wonder things haven't been working. God's given you direction and you aren't all there. 
you haven't followed his direction. This is gonna make a huge difference in your life. I can tell you, this, is, this could be a life changer right here. Awesome. Is there anybody else? I don't want anybody bootlegging this prayer. To get the benefits of this prayer, you gotta stand. I'm gonna pray it won't work if you're seated. You gotta stand up. You gotta humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and then he'll lift you up. Praise God. Father, I thank you for all of these people that have humbled themselves in front of us. And Father, thank you. I believe that you have spoken to them tonight. And Father, they are making a commitment that they may have to get wisdom of how to do it, when to do it, where to do it, whatever, but we will do what you have put in our hearts. Father, we will head in that direction. We will risk everything. We will do what you told us to do. And we just make that commitment right now. And your word says that you are faithful and just to keep that which we commit. So we're making a commitment and we're believing that you're holding us to it. That as we leave our campus days, that whatever it is that you've revealed to us, we say that when we go home, we will follow through. We will do what you have told us to do. And Father, I just thank you for that. Thank you, Jesus. Some of you right now are feeling fear. Like, man, what am I gonna do? And the Lord is saying, fear not. He's gonna take care of you. It may not look like it right now, but if you will just follow through with this, you are gonna have such a tremendous testimony as you see God come through and provide and make everything happen, that this is gonna be something that is, just becomes a powerful thing in your life. One of the things that you constantly look back and gain encouragement from. It may not look like that right now, but when you get on the other side of the Red Sea and you see that God has parted the ocean and destroyed your enemies, you are gonna be singing with Miriam the song of the redeemed and praising God for the good things that he's done. So right now, I just speak peace into your life. Speak that this fear is gone. And Father, I thank you that we will do what you told us to do. And we thank you for this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Isn't that awesome? Praise God. Man, you can be seated. One other thing I wanted to do, I believe also that the Lord was speaking to some people that maybe you're in the process of doing what God told you to do. You're like this third type of ground, but you are so busy that it's choking your life. It's choking your family time. It's choking your relationship with God. And I believe that the Lord is wanting some people to make some, some changes, some commitments and just say, Father, I'm gonna put priority on you. There's gonna be times that I'm still and I know that you are God. If that's you, you may have already stood, but you can stand again. If that's you and you say, I need to make a commitment, I just want you to stand right now and I'm gonna lead you in a prayer and I, we're gonna make some commitments and I believe that this is gonna change your life. Praise the Lord. Amen. I don't know if these are all the same people, but it's about the same number of people, amen. Father, I just thank you and thank you, Father, that you have given us so many things to enjoy. Thank you for the families, for the jobs, for all of the things we've got. But Father, we just make a priority that you are it, that we can do without anything else except you. And regardless of how busy we are, Father, we just establish the priority being on you. And right now we repent of letting the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things enter in and then choke the word. And Father, we repent of that, believe that you're faithful and just and that you aren't mad at us, that you take it out of the way. And Father, I believe that you just instill in us such a hunger for you, such a desire to know you, that we would keep you first, that we would begin to start paring back the things that are choking the word of God in our life. And Father, I believe that your Holy Spirit is speaking individually to people right now and giving them specifics about how they can readjust 
and refocus. And as we do it, thank you, Father, that it's going to bring forth fruit, that we will bring forth fruit a hundredfold. And Father, we thank you for that. We agree and we receive it and praise you in advance that this is going to make a difference in our life in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. Y'all agree? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You can be seated. You know, I'd like to ask for our prayer ministers to come up here and again this evening. I know we ministered to so many. We ministered to hundreds and hundreds of you yesterday at the healing school. Last night, there was many, many people that came up. But, uh, you know, it seems like there's always somebody here that needs prayer and agreement. And these are what our prayer ministers are here for. These are all people that have been through training. They've had experience ministering to people. And I guarantee you the love and the compassion of God flows through these people. You'll have some awesome, awesome things. So if anybody's here and needs anything in your body, if you need a healing or if you need, if you want prayer about some of the things we've already prayed about and you're just saying you need wisdom of how to apply it, that's what we're here for. So I want to invite you to come and let one of our prayer ministers right now just uh, agree with you. If you want prayer right now, if you'd get up out of your seat and come, we've got our uh, people standing at the aisles and they'll direct you to us towards a certain person. And so please come down and receive and get prayer. The rest of you, I, we're gonna have uh, breakfast again, a continental breakfast at seven o'clock in the morning. And then at nine o'clock we start, we only have uh, praise and worship, or excuse me, we start at eight o'clock. We have praise and worship first and then we only have two sessions Wendell Parr who helped me start Caris Bible College will be ministering he's just flying in today from England and then I'll be ministering uh, also in the morning it's going to be a great great time so if you'd like prayer just come forward right now and let one of our prayer ministers pray over you rest of you praise God you're dismissed thanks for coming and we'll see you in the